Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Tonight, we're going to switch it up a little bit and address some issues within the monogastric realm. But the ideas are ones that are generating a lot of interest across all segments of animal agriculture, and that topic is transgenerational inheritance. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, one of your hosts at the Real Science Exchange. We'll have all first timers joining me tonight. First, Dr. Chris Ashwell from North Carolina State University has joined us at the pub. Chris, we talked to you during the Real Science Lecture Series back on May 11th about the epigenetic impact on poultry, and we're excited to continue that conversation here tonight. First, uh, what's in your glass? And then you mentioned during your webinar that the first 1,000 days of human life, starting at conception, is very important for programming us for the rest of our lives. And then you made the analogy that the broiler spends their entire life in this early window of influence. Can you expound on that uh, just a bit for us? In the glass is a gin and tonic, just in that light and refreshing mood today. And um, I appreciate the question. So in the human world, that first 1,000 days is thought to be when a lot of environmental, environmentally controlled aspects of development are um, modulated. And if you use that 1,000 days, so let's just take a round number, first three years of development um, in a human based on its projected lifespan, and then we convert that back to uh, poultry or chicken, um, the broiler that we incubate and hatch and grow uh, to go into the meat market is still within those first 21 days of incubation and 42 days of, of growth within that first 1,000 days, so um, e equivalent to human. So I think there are lots of opportunities uh, to influence the performance of those um, animals so that we can maximize not only production efficiency, but minimize environmental impact, um, create product that is wholesome and um, a, a good quality. Um, quality matters, of course, um, and, and provide uh, nutrition for a growing population. Hmm. Very well. Thank you for that. Uh, and Chris, I see you brought a guest with you here tonight. Would you mind introducing him? Uh, thanks, Scott. So uh, Chandler Keck is joining us today. Chandler is um, in, at the end of his PhD program. He is a, a PhD candidate in the Comparative Biomedical Sciences program at NC State University. Uh, so welcome, well. Chandler. Yeah, Thank welcome, you. Chandler. Thank you for having me. So Chandler, welcome to the exchange. And first I'll ask you the same question. What are you drinking tonight? And then I'll ask to see if you've got a story about Chris that you can share with us. <laughs> uh, uh, first off, I'm drinking uh, Heaven's Door bourbon. That was graciously provided by you guys. It's, Very nice. Uh, first time having it, pretty good sip. Yeah. Um, as for a story for Chris, um, if, if anyone knows Chris, he's a... Um, hands-off kind of leader tells you what 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 the expectations are and lets you go from there he's seen me waddle around a couple times in in some experiments but um he he finally finally uh steps in at the right time and helps out then and i think the biggest example of that is is the first project that a uh, first grand scale project that uh I ran um, at Piedmont Research Station. He kind of gave me the keys and let me run with it. Um, I made some mistakes around the, along the way. And um, at the very end of it, he finally asked, he said, okay, what would you do different? And uh, I think that that really spoke to how the way he, he mentees somebody or mentors somebody. And um, I think that really helped out to get a, a much broader look at things instead of trying to focus on all the small details that go along with the project. He uh, made sure I stepped back and, and looked at the, over, the overview and the impact of it. Mm, nice story. Nice story. And uh, thank you again for joining us here tonight. Um, I also have a new co-host tonight uh, for tonight's conversation. <laughs> Dr. Zach Lohman is the monogastric technical lead for Balchem. And he's also from uh, a graduate of North Carolina State. Um, Zach, what are you drinking tonight? And do you also have a story about Chris and your time with him? <laughs> I do. I'm drinking Miller Lite tonight. Oh, probably one of my most memorable stories, and uh, some of the lab techs still make fun of me about it. Chris uh, took us to uh, a conference in Australia, 
it was my first presentation and we flew to Australia and I was pretty nervous and uh, <laughs> I'd never really given a presentation, especially not in a national conference before. And uh, I was talking about a, um, a novel heat shot protein and I kept saying Novell. And uh, several of the lab techs still walk up to me and say, no veil. <laughs> well, that's a story about yourself there, Zach. I yeah. remember that one. But, uh, well, we don't let him forget that one. Well, I'm personally enjoying a uh, Buffalo Trace tonight, and I usually have a story to go with it. My story tonight is that uh, my, my daughter got me this this nice little snifter uh, for Christmas, and uh because we were locked down for COVID, she was unable to, to come home for Christmas. So I just recently picked it up uh, a couple of weeks ago. So uh, thank you, Miss Hannah, for this very nice glass with Ohio State Buckeyes on it. Appreciate that. So, um, Chris, you received your PhD from the medical school at Wake Forest in biochemistry. Tell us how you came to be a researcher in transgenerational nutrition. Um, so, Scott, that's a funny story. Um, my work in, uh, in biochem at Wake Forest focused on uh, how proteins get out of cells. And so we were um, really interested in tissues or organs that were responsible for protein secretion. So at a point in uh, that time at Wake Forest, we would collect tissues as a source for that enzyme. And the source that we used was the hen oviduct. So this is a tissue in birds that were is really solely dedicated to laying out uh, the albumin, um, uh, the egg white and an egg. And the machinery there was incredibly enriched in this enzyme that we were trying to study. So for my PhD, we looked at substrate interactions um, uh, with the enzyme and um, that sort of summarized my my PhD in biochem. When I went to look for a postdoc, there happened to be an opening with USDA's Agriculture Research Service up in Beltsville, Maryland, and they were interested in uh, molecular factors that influence growth and appetite regulation in broilers. And when I applied for the job, I think I might have been the only applicant that knew what it really how to manage a chicken, how to necropsy a chicken, and then work with the samples from there. So um, it was sort of serendipitous, but that created a pathway um, in a community in, in uh, poultry genetics and genomics, which is quite small uh, globally. And so there probably are about 20 or 25 folks that work in the area uh, that I work in, which is, it, it creates a small community, but it also creates um, opportunities to come and talk to groups like you here today um, as a representative of that that small community. So we all get on the, the speaker circuit, which is kind of fun, and we get to visit folks in places that we never thought we'd, we'd end up. Mm, very interesting. Um, just kind of as a foundation for tonight's discussion, how would you generally describe or define epigenetics or transgenerational nutrition? Well, so uh, epigenetics is, in a nutshell, is any character that is transmitted from one generation to the next that is not encoded in the DNA itself. So epigenetic marks or epigenetic um, uh, signals or regulatory elements are those that are layered on top of that uh, genetic information. And really what it's doing is telling the cell or the organ or the, the organism uh, when to turn things on and off. Um, and, and that setting can be adjusted based on an organism's environment. Uh, so we talk about, um, you just mentioned nutrition. So nutrition is part of an organism's environment. It can be um, excessive or it can be restrictive. And so those aspects of nutrition can influence not only the organism that's consuming that diet, but also its offspring. And so we talked about that in, in our live session. And so the carrying from the, the experience that's being passed from one generation to the next is what we would describe as an epigenetic 
uh, signal or a transgenerational uh, effect. Okay, interesting. Now, one of the things I got to, to wondering was, um, you know, if, if it's a if it's a positive stimuli to the the the, the grandparent or the, the the parent stock, does it always have a positive impact on future generations, or can it can a negative stimuli have positive impacts? Uh, I think it it can vary depending on the model and the 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 sort of the the approach and the tissue and what your target might be. And I'll give you an example. So um, we have a colleague here at, um, at NC State uh, that has worked on uh, in ovo nutrition, so supplementing nutrients inside the egg. And the idea initially was that if I provide the developing embryo with additional um, let's say amino acids, let's focus on protein nutrition, um, that will upregulate uh, the capacity for uh, amino acids and protein absorption. Same thing could be true for adding carbohydrates that you may influence how carbohydrates um, are, you may upregulate that machinery to increase carbohydrate uh, absorption. But what really happens is um, the, the bird is, uh, or the organism is resourceful. So what happens when it's really easy and you have an excess of, let's say, carbohydrates in the embryo, um, they actually downregulate some of that machinery because they don't have to work hard at it. And they're looking for balance. They're looking for equilibrium. So they're, uh, what actually happens is they will upregulate the amino acid um, machinery. And so there's this equilibrium that happens. And so um, we, we first observed that, gosh, it was a PhD student back when I first came to NC State, Andela Foy. She's Andela Tumor now. In the late 2000s, 2004 and 2005, something like that, um, when they were trying to manipulate the early chick by, by adding nutrition into the embryo, what they saw was there was this compensatory effect. Um, the bird was uh, happy with the amount of um, ability to uptake this excess nutrient. And so instead of worrying about that one, they upregulated the other machinery to try and compensate and create an equilibrium. So um, in that case, it was sort of a negative influence. You were um, of trying to affect change in one direction, but were ultimately affecting it in the other. Uh, it always um, makes me uh, think about resource allocation. So how an organism tries to, to take what it has available to it and um, use it to its its most efficient in the most efficient way, and so uh, when you make something more difficult for the organism to do, it will have to move resources to compensate for that. And so you may influence one thing that you're trying to uh, move in a positive direction, but you may ultimately be negatively impacting something else in in, a, in an inadvertent way. And so trying to understand the equilibrium is always important to do. Hmm. Interesting. Chandler, I understand you're going to be uh, having your defense here in July. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your time there at uh, North Carolina State and, and, and some of the research you've been doing. Yeah, so uh, my dissertation focuses on um, various stressors in, in poultry and how they affect um, the transcriptome of the birds experiencing um, that stressor and also how it's passed on transgenerational effects to to the progeny of that of the bird experience in said stressor and uh, two of the main stressors that I have focused on is um, stocking density in broilers and also feed restriction of broiler breeders and um, the feed restriction seems m most um, important to this this kind of talk but um, in broiler breeders we we've been selecting for these birds to have an increased growth rate and um, performance standards. And because of this, um, we've had to restrict, restrictively feed these broiler breeders um, to not allow them to be as big as they potentially could to, uh, for re reproduction purposes. And though this is, uh, has benefits for the reproduction purposes, it is an added stressor on these birds prior to them actually um, producing the, the next generation. So similar to what you've been talking about, this added stress at a, such a critical time in these birds' lives 
um, for development purposes not only has an impact on them, but it also through we found through our research that it has an impact on the next generation. And how would you co- quantify that impact? I mean, it, it, is it economically viable impact? We we didn't really look at it from an economic uh, perspective. We looked at it um, we looked at it through gene expression parameters through RNA sequencing, um, but we did see uh, signals that seem to point to epigenetic mechanisms being induced due to this. We have not got around to um, actually measuring the this DNA methylation, which is what it's what uh, our data suggested. Mm-hmm. Um, I, though I do think it's it's a, an avenue that should be explored further, and upon funding, I, th- I think it's it's an avenue that I hope Chris pursues. Um, hopefully, after I'm gone. Do you have a job lined up yet? You know where you're going? Not yet. I'm open. I'm open ears. So if you <laughs> if you know of anything, please let me know. You know, Chandler's project involves um, very specific feeding ma- programming and management for broiler breeders. And the, our collaborator, uh, whose name is Martin Zwiedoff at the University of Alberta up in, up in Edmonton, has developed uh, this technology. And it's, it includes uh, something that they call a feeding station. And this is, uh, I, I describe the size of it as a, um, uh, a, a dairy bull calf igloo, you know, one of those little mm-hmm. um, uh, plastic contraptions but this one's stainless steel and it sits in a pen of birds and it has a little ramp where birds actually line up to go in to eat because they're they know where their food is they go inside the door the instrument reads the bird id figures out how heavy the bird is and knows what the bird's target weight is supposed to be so then the door opens and the bird is able to move into the feeder location the feeder gives that um, bird the amount of feed it should be consuming at a particular meal and when it's finished it opens a side door and the floor tilts a little bit and the bird comes out and then the next bird comes in and i think i remember martin saying that some birds um, will go to the feeder 20 to 30 times a day and eat lots of small meals and others will will want to go in and, and eat fewer meals but at a you know for a larger amount and so all of that can be controlled um, which is really fantastic for un- trying to understand what the stressors are on these breeder birds as it comes to feed restriction i, I will just give you a, an example of a story when you're in a broiler breeder facility c- conventional and the the birds are on restricted feeding the, my experience was birds that were on um every other day feeding so they're not fed uh, on the odd day but they know they get really excited and worked up in the hour um before they know the feeder is going to go on and they 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 get very um nervous and so um that just is a demonstration that there is something you know physiological happening with these animals as a result of that restricted feeding um I think the precision feeding is a really fantastic way in, in a research setting, and it could be at some point applicable out in a commercial setting to really manage and understand how individual birds eat. I just think it's a great tool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The technology is itself is really fascinating, creating uh, each individual bird being a replicant instead of having to, to work with a larger pin or um, et cetera. It, it really is advantageous for research, but the behavior aspect of the feed restriction and the different ways it's implemented is another area that's absolutely fascinating, uh, or to me at least, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So when you guys are talking about precision feeding, it's mostly around quantity, correct? And not necessarily that, that you're not controlling specific nutrients or individual nutrients. Yeah, that's right. So it's a, a specific feed, but the you can track how much feed that bird should be allocated in a given meal on a given day. And you're monitoring that bird's body weight maybe, you know, 20 or 30 times a day as it enters the feeding station. Mm-hmm. It's, mm-hmm. It's ter- I mean, for folks who like data, it is, you know, it's a it is a dream come true that they can they have tons of it to play with. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Interesting. So you guys were talking before that, uh, you know, these chickens, even though they're, they're, they're bred very similarly and they're doing their very best to make sure that they're uh, monolithic in, 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 in their design, but they're not clones. They're all different. Um, do, do you see us getting to using clones at one point in time, uh, sometime in the future? 
Um, I, well, anybody else want to take that one on? <laughs> it's all you, Chris. Um, I, in cattle and dairy cattle in particular, there has been uh, an effort in creating uh, cloned individuals, cloned cows. Not, not so much concerned with cloned bulls, uh, but those really high producing um, cows are being cloned and those clones are being used in the industry. Um, I think it's viable in that situation where you have one animal who is responsible for an incredible amount of production capacity. Um, get, uh, hundreds of gallons of milk. Um, I, don't, I can't even remember the number. It's, it's larger than you can probably imagine that some of these cows can produce. When we think about um, poultry, on the other hand, the only way to me that that would make sense is perhaps at the breeder generation where you have really elite, um, almost perfect individuals that you may want to preserve and continue on uh, beyond their normal reproductive lifespan. Uh, what I will say is um, a phenomena in, in birds and reptiles is birds and reptiles have a uh, different uh, mutation rate than mammals. They tend to have uh, higher rates of new um, mutations, probably not the right word, but new variants in their sequence that pop up. And so uh, agriculture is taking advantage of that with, with poultry and with large populations and large distributions of, um, uh, of uh, criteria for phenotypes, they can go in and select superior individuals with the uh, characteristics that they're interested in. Once you have those, you just keep selecting and that increased uh, rate of new variants popping into the population hasn't been um, exhausted yet. So the the heritability and um, I, I didn't have Zach in animal. Did I have Zach in animal breeding? No, I had Chandler in animal breeding at NC State. So the heritability of these traits over time is not going away. So that tells you that you still have potential to keep selecting for these uh, economic traits generation after generation after generation, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's an example, the longest running project I think is in maize and corn um, and they've been selecting for uh, over a hundred years and they have not observed any loss in the ability to improve those traits. Um, so I, I think poultry has a long uh, future for continuing to be able to select for these positive traits. So I don't think clones are the answer. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, and in poultry, they do four-way crosses typically just because usually your super high-producing uh, big-breasted birds that people desire aren't necessarily reproductively sound. So they have lines that are more egg-based, fertility-based, and then ones that are meat-based, and you cross them down so that your final production, your final terminal cross is a great big fast-growing one, but your, your higher-ups usually don't produce super great if you, until you get them crossed together. Zach, while well, you have the mic there, uh, tell us a little bit about the research that you uh, you performed there at NC State. I did a lot of, I guess it was uh, nutritional, environmental-type conditioning. So I did some projects on uh, calcium phosphorus conditioning uh, in early life. I did some stuff with hypoxic incubation. Uh, also, I did some work with uh, an emu farm. Uh, it was it was pretty exciting. Uh, but emu uh, have a lot of issues, and they they've not been ver researched very much. So I did a lot of early life stuff on them because they they grow too really fast early on. So you actually have to slow them down, or else their legs give out because they're such big birds. Uh, similar to turkeys, but much much worse because they're so big so a lot of the producers are small backyard people that are doing it so they're trying to get them as big as they can as fast as they can which doesn't work out very well for for emu and I also did some interesting stuff on uh, the, I guess it was the sex ratio so it was resource allocation uh, it was actually one of our undergrads ideas and uh, he was excited and actually we <laughs> Chris and uh, Kate he's actually a vet now um, we're working on that paper a couple weeks ago and we finally got it submitted for publication but uh in, in wild birds so depending on where you're at and stuff you know in, in the wild resources are sometimes more available and sometimes less available and there's actually quite a bit of uh, research on it where where the birds will skew the sex ratio based on which one uh, i guess is more desirable or less 
uh, I guess, least um, costly nutritionally to produce. So uh, we, we actually kind of worked on that in layers in this case because the layer industry has a real issue with extra males. Uh, so we, uh, we kind of found a little bit of a skewing, and we found uh, um, some statistical differences in, in the poultry also. Chris, any other uh, areas we need to drill, drill down in on this precision feeding concept? Um, well, I, I think it's, um, it's definitely a useful tool. Um, I think we have not exploited all of the avenues that it could be used to investigate uh, because the equipment is, is not it's not expensive and it's not off the shelf right now. Um, there are um, sort of equivalent systems in uh, that are used in cattle and small ruminants and um, in, in swine, but primarily they're used in the breeding uh, process where they're trying to identify animals that they want to uh, include in their uh, selection programs. Um, some, some poultry producers are using something similar as well that track the individual behaviors of, of individual animals. What they tend not to be doing is um, distributing feed based on that particular animal's data set. They're just tracking. They're not uh, controlling, which is a little bit of a different um, perspective that precision feeding has. I think the trend is, is clear um, in um, modern agriculture that more data is better and uh, well, in, in all probably science and that sort of realm, more data is always better. And so uh, I see it having a being a major player moving forward in trying to understand how animal agriculture uh, can be optimized. Um, we're, we're always under pressure to, to justify um, management technique you're justifying um, feeding programs, you're justifying whether the animals are experiencing positive welfare and so on. And the more data that you have, the easier it is to defend that the animals are experiencing a, um, that have a positive life experience. I mean, they don't exist unless they're, they have a, a purpose. Um, we wouldn't be breeding as many broilers as we are if there was no market for them to be consumed by uh, us humans, or maybe they go into the pet food supply, wherever they go, um, there's there they exist because there's a place for them to, to end up. Um, I, it, it, animal agriculture is, it's, has its own um, dilemmas because we've gotten really good at growing animals uh, really efficiently um, and uh, the safety is great. And, um, but yet we get criticized because those animals are, are ending up in the food supply. So it I mean you have to understand um, why they exist. And then if the more data that we have that the life of the animal is a, is a positive one, um, you can uh, re easily argue away those uh, notions that the, the animals are being uh, treated um, in, a, in a poor way. Mm -hmm. Very well. Chandler, I know you're looking forward uh, to being gainfully employed here in the not too distant future, but, but if you were to stay uh, and, and, and continue your research, what, what direction would you take that? What, what do you think needs to be done next? What's, what would be the next step? Yeah, so I, I still think there, there is uh, further room for investigation of, the, the, of this feed restriction. Um, from our perspective, we didn't really look at uh, the physiological response. Our team at uh, the University of Alberta, our collaborators, uh, did work with, with some performance parameters based um, stuff, but we didn't really look about stress induction um, and to characterize how much restrictive feeding actually induces the stress, whether it's um, anything under ad lib feeding induces the stress, or is, it, uh, is there a threshold to, to signify this, this stress induction? And as our data suggests, um, there is implications of this uh, feed restrictions on these broilers, and it does um, point towards epigenetic mechanisms such as DNA methylation being being a factor or being induced by this feed restriction. And we st we do need to look at the actual methylation patterns of of uh, these samples to actually fully um, conclude this this 
uh, finding that there is epigenetic mechanisms at work here. We just looked at the end result, looking at the gene expression to see if there is differences observed first. So that was the first step at a, of, of seeing if there is any implications at all um, because of this feed restriction. Next is trying to figure out um, what the actual mechanism at play and uh, an even more difficult question is uh, why these birds are trying to to prepare for this. Because as we talked uh, previously, if, if a bird's not in a good, um, doesn't have available food, why would they choose to reproduce? So there has to be implications on, um, on the reproduction side of things um, because of this feed restriction. And they're trying to prepare their offspring that they do reproduce for this time of feed restriction. So they're trying, and then <laughs> compounding that, they're then they're feeding the broilers ad libitum, trying to grow them um, mm -hmm. as fast as they can. So the, the, this is very um, conflicting ideas. Um, and this is a biological bird, um, living organism. It's going to, like Chris has alluded, there's there's give and take, there's balance to um, to these systems. So that you're trying to figure out that balance um, with still having maximizing production is is a uh, a tall task with a lot of questions and i think i could spend years years looking at it i guess if the funding was there for it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah great answer so you brought up a a, a topic uh, dna methyl methylation um chris i think you've done some research on that uh, can you talk to us a little bit about that why is it important and, and exactly what is it so uh thanks scott so dna methylation is one of the um, mechanisms of epigenetic um, coding or tagging that can be done um, in the genome of an organism. And we've uh, discovered this uh, process, not, not myself, but the, the academy has discovered this process in uh, most higher organisms, including plants. And it is a way for the, the organism to tune its experience based on its environment. And as Chandler alluded to, uh, that tuning prepares uh, the offspring of that individual to be ready to experience that same environment. And so DNA methylation uses uh, methyl donors uh, that are present in the normal uh, biosynthetic pathway uh, that actually get get shunted out of the one carbon cycle um, into uh, labeling regions of the, the genome that really signal whether or not this particular gene should be turned on or turned off uh, at a particular um, period in time or uh, under a period set of uh, conditions. So um, it's, it's a valuable um, next level regulatory element in the genome. And it can be even nutritionally modulated because if DNA methylation um, is needed and there's an inadequate source of methyl donors, then you're not going to get the appropriate um, methylation conducted on the, in the, at the genome level. Um, we've done some work where we have provided excess methylation um, resources or, or methyl donors in the diet. Uh, that um, inc can include um, folate, uh, choline. It can include uh, the B vitamins. Um, so they're, they're valuable uh, components of that um, uh, metabolic cycle. And by manipulating those, we've seen that we can have effects multiple generations later um, without any environmental stress, just by providing the birds uh, additional uh, methyl donors in their diet. So I think it would be interesting to look at Chandler's description of the experiment where you've got um, where you've got uh, precision feeding happening. So you're you're managing the diets of uh, these uh, breeder birds um, to be either close to ad libitum or to um, at uh, breeding company target weights, which in theory, are supposed to optimize reproductive life later on and, and have that replicated with a standard commercial diet, but then have the, the replicate have excess uh, methyl donors in the diet so that uh, those birds may be better able to adapt to that environmental condition. 
what I what I think is um, is really um, it, it's it's in conflict, and, and Chandler described this is in the breeder generation we want to hold those birds back we don't want them to grow as quickly as they possibly can and so they are experiencing a restrictive environment but we want their offspring to grow as quickly as possible and we provide them with an excess uh, excess resources in their environment so what what is that doing what is the what is the consequence maybe the fact that we are feed restricting the breeder birds results in accelerated growth of the broiler generation and makes them more efficient because they were programmed they were tuned to be prepared for an environment that had limited resources and then all of a sudden they're given you know you know, it's this unlimited supply of food. So, um, I mean, I can imagine myself if I had <laughs> been dropped on a desert island and I had nothing to eat but uh, coconuts for a month and then I get picked up uh, by a cruise ship, I'm going to the buffet um, and I'm just going to plop right beside the, the line and keep it, keep shoveling it in. And, and maybe that's what's happening. And, and that, that might be okay. But I think without understanding the mechanism of how that's working, it becomes difficult to argue in favor of the feed restriction component mm -hmm. because there's obvi we, we are able to see um, stress uh, related pathways and molecules elevated as a, a function of that. And uh, my description of walking into the breeder house an hour before the feeder comes on and they get they're already ready to go. They're they're anticipating that feed. Mm -hmm. um, that tells you that there's something happening, um, and, but but that might be a reasonable um, uh, cost in order to make their progeny incredibly efficient. You know, it's it becomes a, a big math problem that you have to be able to weigh what's happening what I do here and what the costs associated with in the breeder generation. And then how does that translate to the economics of the larger scale broiler production? Because it's a, you know, it's a factor of a hundred or so, maybe even more. How many, uh, okay, experts uh, on the panel, how many broiler chicks result from one broiler breeder hen? Oh, so they average probably what two hundred, uh, about one hundred and eighty eggs a year. And if you go, so there you go. So eighty percent hatch rate, which is on the good side. So what you're doing at that to that breeder, that breeder hen, and how you are uh, influencing her, ultimately results in one hundred and eighty. It's her contribution times one hundred and eighty, basically, is what I'm trying to say. So the you know the expansion. Um, you just, it's a math problem and mm -hmm. the folks can do that math, uh, not me, but, um, other mm -hmm. folks can do that math and, and figure out if what is happening at the breeder level makes sense. And maybe it costs you a dollar a hen to do what you need to do, but it might have $180 impact on those broiler progeny. So I think it's, you have to look at, you have to take a step back, right. And look at it. Um, we, I want to know what's happening within the animal and what's happening at the bird level, but you also have to take that step back and say, okay, well, whatever's happening at the bird level gets amplified in this enormous population structure. I also think um, it is important to note that, that these practices of restrictive feeding date back to decades. And though there, there are a ton of great things about agriculture industry, one thing that that is prevalent that I think is a weakness is once we adopt a, a, a practice, you stick with that for long periods of time without fully understanding the ramifications of that. And we've just recently been able to have the technology um, available to us to actually start exploring what is, what this, these practices are causing. So I, I, I think taking us, like Chris said, taking a step back and looking at, okay, why do we do this practice? What are, what are the actual um, impl implications of this and 
why is this bird trying to adapt to this actually fully understand that i don't think it's it's on our fingertips yet but i think there's there is an avenue for exploration that that this could happen within reasonable time mm-hmm. so has martin actually carried any of these uh test birds out to lay um yeah so wait, wait a minute so let me ask you which what you're talking about so yeah. you're talking about um you you would be i think asking about feeding great grandparents influencing the breeders and then the breeders influencing so the the how, how long has he tracked us out through it i guess it's, i haven't looked at his work recently my understanding is he has been doing the work in the breeder generation so mm-hmm. only one generation above the commercial yeah. bird and then he's used the precision feeding um equipment to to manage the broiler generation so you can use it for both i think that's a great question because um we don't have a whole lot of um access to those uh birds uh, higher in the population structure above the broiler breeder Um, but a breeding company might be interested in looking at how the earlier generations may be influencing the progeny for sure because it's interesting on the pedigree lines, especially, I mean, it depends on which side and which line you're talking about, but on your meat lines, you usually do full feed your pedigrees all the way up until, uh, up until market age. But then instead of marketing them, you actually cut them back to restricted feeding to bring them back down so you can reproduce them. So uh, you, you kind of go up then go down, then restricted, then go back to full feed. So it's yep. uh, And some, okay. some breeding programs will do sib testing. So, mm-hmm. Um, they'll have uh, pedigree birds that are, you know, in part of that population. And rather than challenge all the birds, they'll divide the families and they'll say, okay, well, this half we're going to hold on to and keep them ready to reproduce. But this other half, we're going to treat them like they're broilers or whatever the model is and, and grow them uh, you know, as quickly as possible and see then, okay, this guy is great or this hen is great um but we grew them so large so quick they won't be able to reproduce but we have their siblings held back so we could use their siblings in our breeding program that's very interesting i'm I'm not as familiar with the grandparent uh feeding programs but um mammalian and human past studies have the time leading up to um, conception is just as valuable have uh, uh, from an epigenetic and um, effects on the next generation as the actual time in gestation of, or time in pregnancy. So if they're having to restrict these birds prior to um, implementing this, this laying cycle, that's got to have a significant effect on the next generation as well. You know, what's kind of amazing to me guys is, I mean, there's a lot we know already, right? But there is so much we don't know. Just so much we don't know. And we were talking one little slice. We're talking about nutrition. But I remember, Chris, in your presentation, you talked about using an example of, of a, a grandmother that smoked and the impact that that had on the great-granddaughter in terms of uh, obesity. And I'm just wondering, you know, what other things? is What, what impact does heat or, or, or cold or, you know, all of those things. And I can, it's going to keep people like you, Chris, and uh, employed for a very, very long time to try to figure all this out. Where, where, where's it going? What's next? Uh, wow. Okay. So um, there's so many variables, right? So you can't possibly test them all. I think it, no one could possibly test them all. And so trying to understand um, some of the, 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 easier ones to manipulate. So you mentioned heat or temperature. Um, I think that's a great one because uh, I, I've um, familiar with uh, some of the work that's been going on in incubation and manipulating incubation conditions um, that uh, birds, uh, some it, it's almost like magic. The birds can be manipulated inside the egg during incubation by um, altering gases in the incubator or the temperature of the incubator at particular times during incubation. And they are able to reset the body temperature of the bird. So they've been able to increase or decrease 
the resting body temperature of the bird, which to me is fantastic. How, how is this working? Um, the, the, the idea is, you know, if the resting body temperature of a bird, let's just say it's 100 degrees, um, and that requires some metabolic maintenance, right? So there's energy mm -hmm. being expelled to maintain that average body temperature. Well, if you can drop that body temperature by half a degree, the nutrient requirement for that half degree reduction multiplied by the entire life of the animal could be a tremendous uh, savings on resources that don't have to go into maintaining that higher body temperature. As long as you're not and always, here's that resource allocation idea again, as long as that adjustment is not setting the animal up to be more susceptible for disease, um, less able, less efficient at absorbing or, or metabolizing nutrients, then you've created almost a new, uh, a new beast. You know, you've got a new um, variety available. Mm -hmm. uh, we did we didn't talk about this before, but um, I always like to tell students this: when you go to the 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 hardware store, you go to Lowe's, you go to Home Depot, and you buy a a tomato plant or a cucumber plant you almost always will see the word hybrid in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because um, the crossing of, of particular um, animals and plants with traits of, of positive effect, um, they don't always correlate with one another. Uh, as Zach said, you may have a one that grows really re well, but reproduces poorly. So then you have another one that reproduces really well, but grows poorly. So you just cross them. And the way hybrid vigor works is you tend to get animals or plants um, that are hybrids that perform the best. And so um, I think that um, it, it's our take, you know, sort of a real world example of where uh, genetics plays a huge role in, in folks' lives. And the future of animal agriculture um, is going to rely extensively on technology. Chandler mentioned that um, we're just now um, getting mm, accustomed to using the tools that we have available to us. I don't think we fully understand the potential of using some of those tools yet, um, but it, it's a process and it's constantly evolving. Um, similar, similar to what you just said, um, you talked about all these different um, factors or variables that that come into play, but you also had to think of from an animal perspective. They they don't see in the same light spectrum that we see. They don't um, smell the same things that we smell. And relating it back to the technology that Chris talked about, um, there's been discussions with him about this new technology. What was it? Something about a nose. What, what's the name of it? Um, yeah, that's an artificial nose that can measure um, odor in the air. Um, do you want go ahead? Uh, the artificial nose able to to pick up things that um, the human nose isn't able to. You and I can't smell when we walk in. We smell the ammonia, and we're like, all right, we're overwhelmed by that sense, and we don't actually pick up the subtleties that that are um, available there. And and there's um, opportunities to use this artificial nose to to detect things that it could be neutral, uh, nutritional deficiencies in the feces. It could be, um, pathogens, some, um, odor that's associated with a specific pathogens. So I think the, the, um, applications of these new technologies extend way, way beyond just the nutritional aspect of things, but there are ways to tie everything together. And it's just fascinating the the opportunities that, that can come, come about by these technologies. Yeah, interesting. Chris, I kind of wanted to go back to the comment you made about being able to to reset the, the, the temperature of, of chicks in the egg. I'm reminded of something you said during your webinar, which is there's no free lunch, right? There's yep. always there's always a price to pay. And so I'm wondering what are what's the unintended consequences of that? Is I, yeah, it going to impact them? Yeah. OK. <laughs> I, I think that, you know, you have an intended you have a target, right? So the, the design of that experiment was is there some way we could reduce resting metabolic rate or resting need for energy to come in and, um, and and they can do it but then the question my question then becomes okay what what is what are you giving up as 
uh, uh, price for making this adjustment. And that's, of course, limited to the things that you test. Mm -hmm. um, you, uh, we've seen lots of examples of uh, things that have had really positive technology-based uh, um, um, implementation. And then later on, you figure out, oh, when we did this, um, there was this unintended consequence, and we have to go back and fix it. And um, the, the dairy industry, um, uh, breeding in the Holstein uh, breed as a great example of that, um, where one sire uh, really was popular at one point because of, and I think it was protein percent um, in that uh, bull's um, uh, profile for his offspring, for his daughters. And unbeknownst, uh, there was a variant that came along with that increase in one, increase in one um, trait that they cared about that caused uh, a drop in fertility. And if you can't reproduce, mm. it's not getting you anywhere. And so they had to go back. So they went back and, and bred that back out of the population. So um, it was an unintended consequence. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, there are examples in the poultry industry that we've seen come and go. Um, when I was uh, in my postdoc, we uh, experienced this problem with ascites, which was a... Um, in, you know, ac ac accumulation of fluid in the abdominal cavity of rapidly growing broilers. And then it kind of went away um, after about 15 years. And um, some of that has to be attributed to the breeders making selection choices that shift the population in a different direction. Um, we, we're experiencing uh, wooden breasts, so we're experiencing right. muscle myopathies okay. now. Um, I suspect that is, um, it has a genetic component. I think they, breeders have um, accepted that and they can select against it rather quickly. But there must be some positive correlation between a trait that they care about and muscle myopathies. Otherwise it wouldn't have showed, uh, wouldn't have surfaced. And so um, the, the reality is those breeding decisions between a breeding decision and when you can see the outcome in the birds that we eat is like five years. And so it's a slow process. It does, you can't turn on a dime. Um, and so I, I trust the, the breeding companies to, to turn that around. Uh, but then when they turn it around, what's the next thing going to be, you know, in five, five years from now or 10 years from now. So, um, the, the sort of the beauty of epigenetics and manipulating the environment is you don't have to worry about uh, making breeding decisions. You can control it to some degree, I won't say you can control everything, by how you um, control the environment of that uh, animal's um, development. Hmm. Interesting. I'd like to turn it back just real quick, <clears throat> uh, back to DNA methylation. Uh, our company, Balchem, has a ruminant division, and we sell choline uh, to for dairy cattle. And we did an experiment at University of Florida where we had the treatment group, um, the, the, the dams were fed choline, and, and another, the, the control was they did not have uh, choline in the diet. And we found that the offspring um, had enhanced immune function for the animals that uh, came from the mothers that, that consume choline. And so they were exposed to choline in utero. Has anything like that been done? Have you looked at uh, immune function and, and DNA methylation in poultry? So um, uh, that's a great example, um, Scott, of, of where, um, and, and I'm, 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 I suspect that the goal of the experiment was not to manipulate the immune function. It just <laughs> happens to be that's what you saw. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So um, one of the my former students who worked um, with methyl donors in the diet, and I think I talked about these in, in the webinar, um, also looked at uh, performance traits. And, and one of them was egg size. And so she saw an effect of egg size um, in subsequent generations. The other thing that she was she saw was uh, the birds whose and I have to think of exactly what the conditions were. I think it, the birds whose grandparents, not their parents, but their grandparents, 
experienced the high methyl donor diet had a higher immune response to an exogenous antigen. And so in, in poultry, we typically use sheep red blood cells as, um, as a, a model antigen that's not infectious and the, the birds elicit an immune response against it. And then days later, we can take a, a blood sample and measure um, a titer. Um, in just a hemagglutination simple assay. And I think she, if I remember correctly, it was about 50% uh, higher. I'd have to pull the slide. 50% higher, I think, um, immune response in the birds that whose grandparents had the high methyl donor diet uh, than the birds whose parents, or grandparents, sorry, had uh, a control diet. And re remember, um, the birds that we're testing, all on the same diet, no high methyl donors. Their parents, all on the same diet, no no methyl donors. It was their grandparents are the only ones that had the nutrition manipulated. So that just you're like, what the heck? How is this mm -hmm. happening? Mm -hmm. um, where is this coming from? And uh, some of the work that that Chelsea did was doing um, methylation sequencing. So uh, she was able to, and we had. We had time and resources at the at the moment to sequence the the methyl sites in the entire genomes of those um, birds, the grandparents, and then two generations down. And what she was able to do was identify, and the number escapes me, but it was thousands of locations within the genome that had significantly higher methylation status or significantly uh, reduce methylation status. And then the next step, which she's off uh, in a career path now, mm -hmm. but the next step for another student would be, okay, what is, what are these changes in methylation at these specific locations in the genome actually doing in the animal? Um, so Chandler described this, but, but um, we were kind of on a fishing trip um, when we were doing his project with the uh, mm. precision feeding and multiple generations. And we collected a bunch of samples, but we said, okay, let's look at the extremes and see if there's anything else, to, if there's any differences and if there are, then we'll follow them. And I think we actually, I was actually surprised at the number of differences that we saw. I thought it wouldn't be as, as uh, numerous as, as we, um, we were able to detect. So then that leads you to say, okay, well, if I'm looking at the extremes, what's happening, you know, sort of in a graded fashion um, all across the, the distribution of those um, extremes? As you said, it's uh, job security, perhaps, <laughs> to try and understand where that's going. So re relating it back back to my work, we actually saw um, significant differences in a similar test, as Chris described, um, of the effect of stocking density on immune function. And then when you look at the subsequent uh, transcriptome profiles of these birds, you do see genes associated with reduced immune response. And you're trying to connect the dots here, obviously, that there's no um, full known association. But obviously, these methyl donors provide them provide these animals with more availability to be able to pick and choose and adapt to these responses. And I think one of those key responses is obviously immune function to um, adapt to the, whatever environmental stressor through immunity to, to get through and provide for the uh, next generation. Hmm. Good stuff. Gentlemen, uh, any big ideas, big thoughts that we haven't covered yet that, that the audience needs to hear about? Uh, I, one thing that is fascinates me um, is a new area of data analysis called machine learning. This is my new oh, sort yeah. of favorite <laughs> thing. And we're living in a, an era of big data where lots yeah. of data is being collected. And the typical way we look at data is to say, okay, I've got this group of data and I've got this group of data. I'm going to do some statistics. And are they different from one another or how different are they from one another? And machine learning is is going to bring in a new era of pattern recognition mm -hmm. because the differences in these groups might not be statistically different, but the patterns that are uh, occurring within them 
will be detectable by machine learning because it's it's looking for uh, commonality in in the data. And I, I can't, there are so many student presentations and faculty presentations that I've seen at conferences where they say, yeah, we saw this, but it, it was only approaching significance or um, it, it, it was numerically different, but not statistically different. And it, it makes me think and feel that, you know, if there was enough data there and they approached it from a different analytical model, that they might be able to discover patterns that they're not seeing just because they're relying on a p-value. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's going to change a lot. Hmm. Wow, that's a big idea. <laughs> yep, very well. Gentlemen, they just called last call, and it's a good thing I'm, I'm about out here. <laughs> uh, like to get a couple thoughts from uh, all three of you. Uh, what are the next steps in epigenetic research in poultry? would be one. And how will the imp how will that impact uh, commercial production? Let's start with Zach. Well, clearly my uh, interest currently is in choline. So I think it'd be interesting instead of using, uh, I guess, a methyl cocktail as I used before to look at the actual choline uh, effects to see if it has similar effects or if it's one of the other methyl donors or if it's just a combination of them. So I think that would be an interesting thing to see in, in poultry, because especially since we've looked at it in and uh, the cattle, we've actually been doing some, some, there's a huge trial there. I think it's at UNC and humans that they're doing, isn't it, Scott? Yeah. They've been working on for several years, but I think it'd be interesting to look at it in the poultry side on, as far as choline goes. Yeah. Re relating it to that, I, I think if, if you do provide the, these animals with the ability to adapt more easily through these epigenetic mechanisms, you're going to see a lot of downstream effects of these of the practices that we do, do use in this industry, because um, I think it's going to exaggerate the actual results um, that we've previously seen in these um, subsequent generations. So I think providing these birds with um, these methyl donors will allow us to ex um, exacerbate the actual res impacts of the des these decisions we're making. So I think it, it can only help to add these um, methyl donors to allow them more, more room for um, response to these mm -hmm. different choices we are actually making on these birds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. I like both of those ideas. Um, the reality is you have to be able to do this across multiple generations to see what's really going on. And, um, you know, humans is, that's a challenge because, um, you got a lot long, uh, generation interval there, cattle a little bit shorter, but doing it in poultry and some of the work that we, we sort of started this with was in quail where we had really short generation intervals. Um, and you could go from one generation to the next in, in two to three months, um, which is really terrific. It's, it's the mouse of the poultry world. Um, <laughs> and that, the, you know, you can do things um, with, with in, in small scale too, because they don't eat as much as, as uh, chickens do. And then follow that through um, multiple generations. I, I like the idea of, of using a single donor like choline. But as Chandler mentioned, uh, I also agree that I think it will provide the birds with the enhanced means to adapt. And so not just feeding them choline and not feeding them choline, but adding on an additional challenge to try and force them to adapt in one direction or the other. And maybe that's temperature. That's an easy one. Um, it could be um, another, we may pull another nutrient out of the diet as a challenge could be feed restriction it could be could be lots of things but um i think having some stressor there to push the birds to try to adapt or to that stressor and then the having the methyl donor like choline either there or not there provides them the fuel for that adaption to happen um i think that would be a great experiment excellent Chris, thank you for uh, joining us both at the webinar and here at the exchange. Uh, exciting stuff you're working on. I really uh, enjoyed getting to know you and, and, and having you here at the exchange. Chandler, you're an exceptional young man. Uh, I'm a fan already. I wish you the very best and I look forward to following your career. You know, this is, this is next level nutritional impact is so important for all species and will continue to be a point of interest for years to come.
I also want to thank all of our loyal listeners for stopping by at the exchange to sit with us a while and have a, a few drinks and share some conversation. If you like what you heard, please remember to drop us a five-star rating on your way out. And remember, you can uh, also get a really cool Real Science Exchange t-shirt just by uh, hitting the like or subscribe button on your favorite podcast platform and then sending us a screenshot along with your uh, shirt size and address. Uh, send that to anh.marketing at balchem.com and we'll send it out to you. Our scientific conversations continue on the Real Science lecture series of webinars. Uh, visit balchemnh.com slash real science to see upcoming events and past topics or to view Dr. Ashwell's full presentation. We hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. Mm-hmm.